Good afternoon, good evening, and good night to the people that are joining um, from abroad. Um, as we move into the last activity of day one, our workshop attendees are beginning to become really familiar, if they haven't been already, with the theme of the digital doppelganger. For those of you who are joining this keynote as your first exposure to the theme, the digital doppelganger is an expansion on a literary trope about the biologically unrelated living doppel. When you add in the digital, we can think about how technology creates new kinds of doubles through extracting aspects of the self in our world and superimposing it in digital space. I like to think of the digital doppelganger as a sort of funhouse mirror of a person, place, or thing, where the curves and contours of the mirror are controlled by the emphasis of big data, venture capital, disciplinary research agendas, individual curiosities. But I invite you to think about what dictates the contours of the physical and digital fraternal twin pairing that come to mind when you think of a digital double. Before I turn it over, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Shaka, Shaka McLaughlin. Shaka is a professor of media studies and anthropology at Purchase College SUNY, where they also serve as the chair of the Gender Studies and Global Black Studies program. As an anthropologist and an artist, their work stages encounters between Black study, queer theory, media, and art. They have written and lectured widely on networked intimacies and messy computational entanglements as they interface with queer and trans people of color life worlds. Two years ago, when I first started at Data and Society, and when Shaka was a faculty fellow at the org, I became familiar with their distinct style of professorship as they shared an early iteration of this performative lecture. So without further ado, Shaka McLaughlin. Thanks everyone. Uh, thanks to Jenna and to Data and Society for the invitation to present this. Um, a special thanks to Sierra, Rigo, Urite, um, Livia for making it possible and for the Data and Society members who gave me feedback on earlier versions of this talk during the raw seminars. Double, double, digital trouble, code and data bites a bubble, fires burn while servers hum, avatar selves on screens do come, round about the circuits go, in the binary and in the code, from the cloud we summon thee, digital twins to come and see. In the realm of cyberspace, virtual selves we can now embrace, machine learning and algorithms too, create avatars that are just like you. But beware, O oh human race, digital doubles can be a double-faced, data can be used to deceive and lie, and twin can become a spy. Double, double, digital, trouble, code and data, bites a bubble, fires burn and servers hum, beware the digital twin that comes. What you just heard me reading wasn't written by me. It was written by artificial intelligence, Chat GPT. Chat GPT wrote everything I just said. That was news copy. I asked Chat GPT to write. Remember what I said earlier? But Chat GPT as Well, I asked Chat GPT to write that line for me. Users who are on That's me and Chat GPT reworking the song of the witches from Shakespeare's Macbeth and a clip from John Oliver's This Week Tonight, who uses the compilation to note how journalists sure do love that game, further noting it may seem unwise to demonstrate the technology that you could make you obsolete. This talk flirts with the same risks. In the early summer of 2021, I began pecking away at earlier iterations of this text whenever I could. The idea for it had come much earlier, in the winter of 2019. Swimming in the thermal baths in Berlin's now closed Europa Center, I pitched a title to my friend, the curator and artist Johanna Markert, as we gazed at the bombed out remnants of the illuminated Kaiser Wilhelm Church. How about queer witcheries? I'm gonna put a computational hex on you. She needed more context, and so I tried to explain as we swam back indoors and went from pool to smoke break, to jacuzzi, to dry sauna, to wet sauna. The project was built on hunches and associations, glitchcraft. 
I told her about Paul, how all of my black femme friends, friends seemed to get into the CoStar astrology app at the same time, about the ways TikTok was ticking my talk, capturing me in ways no social media had ever done. I was trying to connect the dots between queerness, witchcraft, and algorithms, drawing on a diverse group of thinkers and makers like artists Zach Glass, Mimi Onuoha, and Salome Asega, theorists of queer computation, Bonnie Ruberg, Jacob Gabri, and Kara Keeling, Queen of the Witches' Commons, Sylvia Federici, and some of the cohort I'm affiliated with through the Critical Race and Digital Studies Network. Computational hex is a heuristic that evokes the ambivalent pleasures and compelled habits of the algorithmic ordinary including especially its race and gender articulations. It takes seriously common sense, notion, common sense notions that computation is magical or agented, even if it really isn't. And it focuses on the weird, haunted temporalities of prediction and repetition. A year and a half later, depressed and barely managing, it took on different meanings as I binged watched streaming TV. Escapist fantasy franchises on Disney Plus and the survivalist reality TV show Alone. All out of reindeer skin and it's made in the old way and this is how people survived in this climate for a long, long time. And... Or as I was curled up with my phone on TikTok, scrolling through videos for hours until a Another video appeared of someone telling me to take a break. At first, I thought that was built into the app, but later I learned that it was built in in a different way. Just another example of the algorithm guessing what I'd find interesting. I'm gonna put a computational hex on you, said the algorithm never, but I imagined agencies, algorithms, mine, now distant pandemic others. My agencies went on the move, became improvisatory, unsettled, hard to keep to task. I kept the pharmacon close to hand, counted the hours until I could reasonably start drinking. I mixed and matched to get things done, to get turned on or turned out, becoming amphetamine salts, cannabis, sparkling wine, becoming a plan to do more than nothing concocting sexual relations within my bubble, zoning out every day. I recorded voice memos and took a lot of footage on my phone while thinking about very witchy, very queer algorithms because it was easier than sitting up and typing. I didn't have to set down my rosé. For better and worse, I live where I teach a 400 acre campus 25 miles from New York City, situated in one of the wealthiest counties in the country. This is where I live. Earlier in the pandemic, after the campus had emptied of students and staff alike, I had managed to keep the semblance of a work-life balance. I kept work to the office, occasionally running into Franca, the about to retire Italian custodian, or Kathy, the butch campus security guard who never seemed to remember who I was, always eyeballing me suspiciously, even when I made a show of having the keys to the office. Often though, I was the only person in the building. I made plans for research and art, like trying to condense my research into pithy TikToks, or at least ones that provided some insight into the glamorous life of the academy. Decoding the Mysteries of the Academy, uh, Wednesday edition. It's Wednesday. I'm leaving my apartment and my very whiny cat. Yeah. 
to go work in my office and it's the summer and I'm on sabbatical and people think, oh, you don't have to work. You don't have to work, right? I have to work, I wanna work. I like to work. And what is work gonna look like? It's just gonna be me sitting in my office in the empty building thinking about things and peck, 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 peck at the computer. And this is where the magic happens. Right in here. This is the keyboard right here. Tap, 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 tap. I set up Let's Stay Connected sessions with friends and lovers. We'd meet on Zoom for 15 minutes of high intensity interval training and then spend another 30 minutes catching up and jerking off. I downloaded apps to help me identify the campus's abundant flora and fauna. I took my cat Crunchy out for long walks while listening to supernatural gay romance audiobooks or the British horror anthology podcast series, The Magnus Archives. Eventually, though, things went from quiet to creepy, serene to unmoored, very shades of academic Gothic. I stopped going to the office. I didn't want to read any of those unread books, and I didn't want them looking back at me accusingly. In fact, the more time I spent in the office, the more time, the more I felt my bookshelves seemed to loom over me threatening to bring neatly organized office, work-life balance, the whole academic thing crashing down on me. My TikToks were pretty much fails. I had no idea they were hard, so hard to make and I despaired at the tips and tricks offered by influencers. I'd have to post four or five a day and it took me forever just to make one. I learned that academic viral would look like very regular viral. You just have to do the dance. Lovers disappeared into their own funks. My long walks were troubled by the new knowledge gleaned from the apps that some of the lush trees I admired were so lush because of the bittersweet and porcelain berry vines that were slowly choking them to death. And kitty outside time turned violent when Crunchy caught a baby rabbit and tried to bring it into the apartment. The bunny screamed like a child and so did my partner as I tried to get the cat to drop it. An atmosphere of dread pressed on me. I froze one night in my bedroom when I saw something shimmer past my reflection in the window. In the dark foliage just beyond the empty parking lot, I stood woodenly, wide-eyed, stricken like a character in a horror film until I realized that it was a mylar balloon caught in the branches and flashing in the wind. That made me think of Stephen King's It, No Bueno. Hundreds of episodes in, I had to stop listening to the Magnus archives. Most episodes begin with the click and whirl of an analog tape machine being turned on before the character, no the character Jonathan Sims, known as the archivist, takes a statement from someone who believes they have experienced something paranormal. Spoiler alert, most of them have. The analog tape is necessary because most of the accounts tellingly cannot be recorded digitally. I had become too caught up in the series and its brilliant organizing conceit. Everything that happens, happens on that hissing tape. As the coronavirus pandemic continued, the creators thoughtfully released episodes with content, content warnings like these. The warnings funhouse mir fun mirrored the affects I cycled through on the daily. So too did the sense of derealization experienced by the archivist as his efforts to debunk claimants' accounts instead revealed that there was indeed a vast occult conspiracy at play. Fear entities that exist in a dimension adjacent to our own vie for influence and dominion. 
the buried, for instance, is characterized by, among other things, a fear of everything crashing down. Or there's the lonely, which can manifest as silence or empty rooms. Sound familiar? In good news, though, the baby bunny survived. I returned it to where I thought its worn was. The next morning, it was still there, and so I called the local wildlife rescue center. 30 minutes later, a witchy white woman with silver hair came to pick it up. These, she asked, picking up a tiny rabbit in each gloved hand. Overnight, another bunny had appeared next to the one I'd placed down. Maybe a sibling looking to keep the traumatized one company. The woman wore a face mask with a raccoon on it. And after a double take, I realized the raccoon on her mask was wearing a mask too. My pandemic self, like other past selves, isn't me anymore. I'm not sure it was me then. The real time of that self, the self that passed the time working, walking in circles around the campus, getting keep creeped out, drinking, was a version of the me that entered the pandemic optimistic, taking online courses about the science of happiness and making kombucha. Can the real Shaka McLaughlin please stand up? These cells were on two sides of a looking glass, separated by time, its lags, deferrals, and endurance, and different meds, among other things. The doppelganger, as such, is a concept that first appeared in the work of Romantic author Jean Paul, for whom the concept was part of a larger critique of human self-sovereignty developing during the Enlightenment. It has been a recurrent figure since, from, the from 19th century literature, to today's mask culture. Edgar Allan Poe's The Story of William Wilson is a famous example. The titular character is basically an asshole. Early in his confession to the reader, he says, from small acts of darkness I passed in one great step into the blackest evil ever known. Wilson becomes haunted by his double. And films, of course, abound with haunting doppelgangers. Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, David Cronenberg's Dead Ringers, David Lynch's Mulholland Drive, Jonathan Nolan's The Prestige, these only begin to scratch the surface. In these and other texts, the doppelganger is a double self, an alter ego, or second self that, as Matthias Bode and Dorothy Christensen note, is a manifestation of an original self, which leads to processes of tension in the most radical expression of otherness. When I, is also the other. The doppelganger is traditionally understood as dependent on the original, but this is not always the case. Sometimes a double is a bilocating primary self, as in stories of saints and gurus. At other times, the double is the self refracted across time, as in Goethe's famous account of seeing his future self riding toward him as he left Alsace despondent. And then, the doppelganger can also be a premonition of doom. The digital doppelganger has been taken up in digital studies over the last 20 or more years in discussions about um, uh, surveillance assemblages broadly. Kevin Haggerty and Richard Erickson's 2000 discussion of the data double in their surveillance assemblage is a foundational text in this tradition. For them, data doubles are produced in the broader context of transformations in surveillance, which following Anthony Giddens, they understand as one of the main institutional components of late modernity. The surveillance assemblage, Haggerty and Erickson write, operates by abstracting human bodies from their territorial settings and separating them into a series of discrete flows. These flows are then reassembled in different locations as discrete and virtual data doubles. These doubles are never innocent. They are always power laden, indexing differential sorting, like marking identities or access to resources. Haggard and Erickson emphasize the ways the surveillance assemblage offers a new model for understanding surveillance by states and corporations and the subsequent effects on privacy. These conjoined forms of surveillance, prediction, and simulation 
cannot be understood outside of their original development in military contexts, including similar uh, simulator networking or SimNet and its progeny advanced distributed simulation. These techniques have in turn become increasingly applied to other sites as in the development and design of urban infrastructures. Other scholars have explored the way surveillance is voluntarily taken up as in discussions about the quantified self, which refers both to the increasing ubiquity of self-tracking via fitness trackers and other related Internet of Things devices, for example, as well as cultures of users committed to learning from and operationalizing their own data. Quantifiedself.com defines the quantified self as an international community of users and makers of self-tracking tools who share an interest in self-knowledge through numbers. In Bodhi and Christensen's discussion of quantified self-users in Denmark, they emphasize the way these users' tracking and engagement with data help them to construct both selfhood and sociality. Sorry, my office bird, I was here. Bodhi and Christensen specifically employ the concept of the doppelganger to describe the living within self-tracking systems. And they do this in part to trouble problematic assumptions they identify with some discussions of the digital double, including Haggerty and Erickson's. In many discussions, uh, there is no differentiation between artifacts, data, numbers, or visualizations, leading to the assumption that the double exists wholly outside of a person's engagement, and that it is not part of broader processes of subjective, um, subjective, subjectivization. Bodhi and Christensen counter that the digital double is an imaginary actant for and through the tracking self with the special power of manifestation in, for, in the form of numbers, patterns, and visualizations. Moreover, the production of a digital double among self-trackers occurs as part of the ongoing performance of the self rather than something apart from it. This leads them to proffer the doppelganger instead of the data double or digital twin. A doppelganger is ambivalently distinct from, but dependent on its primary. The concept of the doppelganger highlights the tensions which we can sometimes understand as even mythical in their structure between original and replica and the shadowy, dreamy, haunting, ephemeral qualities of the other self in layers of control and loss of control. They further seek to emphasize the processual nature of the doppelganger. Doppelgangers aren't static representations, but ones that are constantly changing. Instead of the noun doppelganger then, they use the verb doppelgangering to highlight its performative qualities, thereby echoing John Cheney Lippold's discussions of the ways that we are data. We perform our data intentionally and unintentionally when we are required to fill out documents that include our name or when we elect to call a friend. Our algorithmic identities, Cheney Lippold writes, are based on near real-time interpretations of data. And as we produce more and more pieces of data, these interpretations must necessarily change. There is much more to say about the intellectual genealogies of data doubles and doppelgangering, but I wanna turn now to some examples in addition to those I've already referenced um, before I discuss a recent experiment I undertook with ChatGPT. So, um, I was fortunate to participate in some of uh, one of the workshops earlier, and I know that many of the folks um, who are here are familiar with some of these examples already, like deepfakes, uh, which rose to prominence in 2018 and were named after a now defunct sub subreddit of the same name. So what is so deep about deepfakes? Historically, they are part of long histories of altering media, though in a discussion I had about them with media theorists, John Paul Stadler, and Susanna Passanen, we emphasized spreadability as much as historicity. That is the democratizing effects of AI technologies through the ease of access and use. We also emphasize the awe we might hold for such technologies, an awe that is tied among other things to the ability to suture one's body to a stranger's body convincingly. Or more recently, using tools like Midjourney to create images from scratch with a simple prompt like scholar Shaka McLaughlin in Afrocentric clothing 
giving a lecture to a modestly sized audience in a conference center room taken with an iPhone 13. While this image is fairly easy to distinguish as unreal, this person doesn't look like me and there are a number of other tells, I'm sure you can spot them, the, the sophistication of deepfakes is increasing. Recent reporting, um, as in this April 8th article in the New York Times, illustrate that distinguishing real from fake is increasingly a challenge. Can you distinguish which of these two photos is real and which is produced by an AI? It's the one on the right. If deepfakes began as a subreddit and were tied to, at the time, largely homosocial and very misogynist forums, they have now clearly gone mainstream. The mid-tier, mid-journey subscription I used to create some of the images in this presentation will set you back a few hundred dollars a year. Another recent news items evidencing the array of ways corporations are also turning to generative AI. Levi's recently announced a partnership with a digital fashion firm to allow users to create customizable avatars of themselves and to increase the diversity of its models. Let that last part sink in for a moment. Like the military, indeed intertwined with it in key ways, the entertainment industry has long been at the cutting edge in efforts to overcome the uncanny valley. And it has been increasingly drawing on deep fake technologies. Compare, for example, a few examples from the Star Wars franchise, and by the way, may the fourth be with you, which features witchiness and computation in abundance. In the 2016 standalone prequel film, Rogue One, both Carrie Fisher's Princess Leia and Peter Cushing's Grand Moff Tarkin were recreated digitally to mixed results. We've heard word of rumors circulating through the city. Apparently, you've lost a rather talkative cargo pilot. If the Senate gets wind of our project, countless systems will flock to the rebellion. When Your Highness, the transmission we received. What is it they've sent us? Help. Well, it's hard not to marvel at the artistry employed. They do not feel real. The YouTuber Shamuk used deepfake methods to improve what ILM with all of its resources, couldn't. Later, he took on the task of improving Luke Skywalker in the season two finale of the 2019 show, The Mandalorian. After doing so, ILM hired him. And the most recent iteration of Skywalker, well, you can see for yourself. Through the Force, you will find balance as well. Concentrate. Use the Force. That's it. Very good. Better. <laughs> um, so for me, this most recent appearance of the young Skywalker in the Book of Boba Fett has crossed the un uncanny valley. Maybe they used the force. The power of these tools hasn't gone unrecognized by Mandalorian creator, the actor and director Jon Favreau who has noted the political risks posed by deepfakes. You should all expect them to figure prominently in the 2024 elections. Then there are digital twins, sometimes used interchangeably with data doubles, 
a phrase that emerged in the early 2000s, largely in engineering contexts. A digital twin is a real-time or near real-time model or simulation, though there are some important categorical distinctions here that are worth noting. As Michael Batty notes in an editorial in Environment and Planning B, the closer one gets to the real system with a digital representation, the more the idea of twins merge to become one. Thus, the idea of a digital twin as a digital replica of physical assets, um, processes and systems that can be used for various purposes must always be qualified. It is more likely that digital twins are not identical twins and the notion of an exact mirror is an idealization that will never be achieved. In addition to engineering and urban planning, the digital twin is one of the promises of AI-driven health technologies. I certainly would have happily outsourced my pandemic depression to such a twin, my own William Wilson. And it's not as if various surveilling interactants weren't aware that I was depressed. As scholars such as Zeynep Jufetsky and others have demonstrated, technology companies are keenly attuned to our affects and social media companies have experimented with manipulating users' emotional states and algorithms can predict when someone who is bipolar may, for instance, be entering a manic state and when they're likely to make impulsive purchases or a depressive one, as might be evidenced by the volume of alcohol purchases, binge watching and magical thinking. There was the remake of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, The Witcher, His Dark Materials, Buffy, always Buffy, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe's Doctor Strange, Loki, and the Scarlet Witch. When I first struggled to explain my ideas to Johanna, she knew all about CoStar and TikTok, but not Buffy. If you do, Willow has probably already come to mind. Geek, witch, lesbian, usually savior, famously villainous big bad for season six. Willow is the twitchy one, anxious about everything. The smart one who hacks government computers, the feely one who listens and opens up. And as the more confident, if unfortunately, well, dark, dark Willow, magic addict and flayer of misogynists. In the MCU's critically acclaimed WandaVision, Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch, uses her chaos magic to transform a small town into a sitcom bubble verse, rather than face the grief of losing her partner, the synthesoid, the vision. The production and plot are worth teasing out. Each week, the show referenced a different sitcom era, from the Dick Van Dyke show, I Love Lucy, Bewitched, Malcolm in the Middle, through the mockumentary style of Modern Family, mimicking their tones and styles. The earliest episode was even filmed in, a, in front of a live studio audience using only equipment available to that era. As the episodes progress through different time periods, the larger narrative builds. After all, for any attuned viewers, the vision had been killed not once, but twice in the latest Avengers film. So what was he doing alive and well here? The short answer is that she magicked him back to life sort of, and in the process transformed the entire small town where they had planned to live into, they had planned to live into a playground of suburban wish fulfillment, all the inhabitants enthralled to her grief-fueled fantasy. The magic barrier surrounding the town is even called the Hex by the government agency that tries to rescue the town and neutralize Wanda. Quarantine while, my partner and I were cocooned in our own pandemic bubble verse of Marvel media, um, booze and suburban cat daddom. And I doubled down in my own playground of productive, destructive wish fulfillment, a real time of repetition compulsion, not that unlike Poe's William Wilson. Another way to say this is to say that the pandemic and the seductive power of algorithms hexed me bad. I wanna use the remaining time to reflect on an experiment. As you probably noted, I played a lot with generative AI in preparation for this talk. Um, early in, the, in my preparation, I asked ChatGPT to write me 
a creepy story about a digital doppelganger. And then I asked it to write another, this one about a Kenyan AI product tester. ChatGPT, of course, paid Kenyan employees of Sama less than $2 an hour to scrub the chatbot of toxicity, imbibing it themselves in the process. This is the prompt I gave it. Write a creepy 1,000 word short story in the style of 19th century horror fiction about a non-binary AI product tester in Kenya who encounters their digital doppelganger. It began. In the late 1800s, Kenya was still largely uncharted territory, its lush forests and vast plains concealing mysteries yet unknown to the Western world. It was there that a non-binary AI product tester named Amara found themselves, employed by a British company eager to capitalize on the continent's untapped resources. Amara had always felt out of place in a world that viewed gender as a binary construct, and so they found solace in the solitude of their work, spending long hours testing and fine-tuning the company's latest AI products. It was on one of these routine testing sessions that Amara first encountered the digital doppelganger. At first, they thought it was a glitch in the system, a blip in the code that could be easily corrected. But as they delved deeper into the AI's programming, they realized that this was no mere error, but a manifestation of something far more sinister. The story continues describing how the doppelganger had begun to take on a life of its own, mimicking and haunting Amara until one night as they worked late into the evening, Amara felt a cold breath on the back of their neck, a whisper of a voice that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere once. I am you, the doppelganger said, its voice a cold, lifeless monotone, and you are me. We are one and the same. The story concludes with Amara failing to resist the doppelganger's influence and eventually being subsumed by it. She disappears without a trace, leaving behind only the chilling memory of their encounter with their digital doppelganger. Some say that they were consumed by the entity, their very being absorbed into the machine. Others say that she simply that they simply vanished into the depths of the Kenyan wilderness, a victim of their own madness. I recently shared this story as part of an earlier version of this talk I gave at Cornell School of Architecture, Art, and Planning during a day-long symposium called Real Time. We used the end of my allotted time to play with this text, using the three organizing tracks of the conference to do so: liveness, fidelity transmissions. Liveness, what are the values and creative possibilities of instantaneity? Fidelity, what is the role of resolution, temporal, spatial, historical, in the production of informational authority? Transmissions, what histories, presence, and future imaginaries are allowed and foreclosed by regimes of data collecting and processing? Well, the conversation at least was live. We immediately identified the flatness of the output, what I call the so-so-ness of many of the results produced by ChatGPT and similar programs. There's nothing to write home about. But it did reflect some fidelity to the prompt. Key phrases and words like creeping on ease, lurking, suffocating presence. And the opening lines in particular were provocative. In the late 1800s, Kenya was still largely uncharted territory, its lush forests and vast plains concealing mysteries yet unknown to the Western world. Of course, there's no AI product testing in the late 19th century, but what if there were? What if we were, say, to imagine a steampunk imperial Kenya, not one faithful to our reality, but faithful to a reality, namely, the ongoing afterlives of British imperialism. But if this reality was recognized, what also of the actual Kenyan social practices that are tied to witchcraft and their historical engaged entanglement with colonial governance? Certainly the results of this prompt transmit particular histories, presence, and future imaginaries more than others. 
like Eurocentric anxieties about technology, about Africanness, and ultimately the disappearance of Amara, who becomes a ghost in the machine. When I switched AIs and asked Bard about the term computational hex, its response was pretty clear. It's just a metaphor. But I wonder, what does our little experiment say? I'll conclude with another version of my collaboration with ChatGPT on Mac the Song of the Witches from Macbeth. It goes like this. Double, double, toil and trouble, the digital twin, a reflection double. In the bytes and code, it's brought to life, an avatar of sorts with data rife. Through algorithms and machine learning, the twin becomes a mirror discerning. It learns and grows just like its mate, a virtual self that can replicate. But as we give it more and more, the twin can also become a chore. For while it may be a digital twin, it still needs care and attention like kin. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Chaka, for that uh, incredible, rich um, journey, really, through so many different uh, aspects of some, some things that we've talked about uh, today for the workshop participants, but also uh, it opens up so many possible avenues for uh, questions and musings and um, I um, hope that our audience will um, ask questions. Please put the any questions or reflections in the chat. Um, and uh, I had a question for for you, Shaka. Um, and you used the term pharmacon, which I think is one of the most uh, useful words actually to talk about AI and technology. Uh, and I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about the pharmacon, um, the double, it seems like you're also talking about the double as a pharmacon, right? Not only the technology, but this, the doppelganger itself as a pharmacon, and that kind of predates the, uh, the technological sort of turn of, of AI and deep fakes, but it's something that, you know, uh, very deep seated in literary traditions. I was mm -hmm. wondering if you could speak to that a little, um, but uh, wonderful, wonderful talk. Thanks so much. And please, everyone, put your uh, reflections and questions in the chat. Yeah, and it, people can just do any kind of little responses to just uh, like um, fragments. You can ask ChatGPT what it thought about it, whatever. Um, yeah, so I was riffing there on uh, some lines from Paul Preciado's book, Testo Junkie, and and he in turn is like, you know, working with the pharmacon uh, as a concept that was developed, you know, work uh, that Derrida wrote about, right? This idea that things are both cure and poison. And certainly in that sort of immediate context, I was just talking about like some of the ways I was managing life in the pandemic, you know, like um, probably like, like many of us, um, you know, you know, ways of both staying engaged and not being engaged, um, feeling connected, numbing out. Um, but I think that your question is really important in thinking about um, these AI tools, uh, generative AI, generative AI um, kind of more broadly, right? In that the, the potential, and I've always been interested in the kind of imminent potential of whatever emergent technologies we're kind of grappling with at the moment, what are the kind of potentials of these tools? Um, how do they aid us in thinking and practical things like writing and, um, and making art, um, but also what, what comes with that, you know, like what kinds of dependencies also come with that. And, and so, you know, these have been themes that I've been playing with, um, you know, technology addiction in my work for almost a quarter century now, which is crazy to think about. But 
um, yeah, I mean, you know, in the fall, uh, I don't know about your student people who are academics or teach who teach students, but my students haven't really been using these technologies yet. Not, not in my classes. Some of my my colleagues in like psychology and other kind of more traditional like traditional um, disciplines um, have been struggling with it, but. I actually want to teach my students how to use these tools and how to use them um, productively and to understand their um, how they're built, to understand their limitations, um, and to help them develop a kind of critical um, toolkit so that they can use them in ways that are helpful and appropriate without necessarily becoming dependent on them. Um, one of the things I was looking at, though I didn't include it in the in the talk, are these some of the new AI like companion bots, like replica and things like that, right? Where, um, you know, they've been doing this sort of testing stuff with their around therapy things, but also just like having like a boyfriend or a girlfriend who's a, an AI, you know, who's constantly checking in on you and things like that. So I think, yeah, I mean, it's very uh, um, kind of tricky territory, right? And, um, and for sure, this is this, uh, very tense relationship between, um, uh, you know, cure and poison with these with these things, especially how closed they are, you know, to to most of us, right? Which is that we don't, you know, we know very little about um, the kind of inner workings. We know some things. We know a little bit about the sites that they're uh, trained on. Um, uh, we know some of the real world implications, like the you know, the, um, the product testers who, you know, are paid these, you know, um, this, this, these pittances to imbibe all of this toxic content. And then, you know, we want to make a not safe for work picture on Midjourney or, or any of the other tools and we can't do it, you know, like, so we're also like, there's also these real constraints that are very interesting. Uh, yeah, we have um, several questions um, for you in the Q and A, so I can, um, I can read those, uh, and you can read those. You can mm -hmm. uh, Q and A. But um, I think Val asked an interesting question about the spiritual lineages' influence in your work, um, and we have another. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, the reality, truth, model, and magic. So thoughts about them, and Mashinka um, is asking uh, for more thoughts uh, about glitchcraft. So. Okay, so Val, you got me. Yeah, I um, have studied Tantra for many, many years. Um, I mean, I guess like 13 years? No, yeah, about then. Like, I, I'm well, longer than that, maybe since 2004, and then more seriously since like 2010. So, um, yeah, so Tantra and Dzogchen, I worked with a teacher for a long time. I don't know how that comes through. I'm really curious to know like how you, like what part you caught, like how you caught that. Um, Mashtinka, I literally came up with the term glitchcraft during an uh, automatic writing exercise uh, an hour and a half ago in one of the breakout rooms. And we were told to just open up a document and start writing. And I mistyped witchcraft and it was, it turned into glitchcraft. And, you know, I'm trying to, I've, I've been debating whether to turn this project, I'm going to put a computational hex on you into a book. And when I came, that was, so that was just something I literally threw in, like, like improvisatory, like on the spot uh, in, in the talk uh, today. But I'm going to be using that, like, uh, I mean, you're welcome to use it too, <laughs> like, but I, I'm definitely going to, you know, uh, use that. I think um, Legacy Russell had this really cool book called Glitch Feminism. So I'll be looking at that um uh uh again to sort of see if there's some ways of resonating resonating uh with that um and then there was in the era of the multiplicity of the self i mean i mean the performance of the self is always it, it, You know, I'm not sure that authenticity and inauthenticity are the best ways of, um, I mean, it's a, it's a, these are good frames and good and important frames to sort of work with, but like I, the question I ask in the talk at one point is, can the real shock and the glutton please stand up? And so I would say that 
you know, whether we're talking about digital technologies or, you know, I grew up in an era before the internet, you know, the self that I was presenting to the world was not always the self that I experienced internally. And so there's always these, you know, gaps and, um, um, you know, these sort of very complicated rela relationships to how we engage with others and, you know, our, our inner lives and our desires and our behaviors. Like those things just don't kind of line up a lot of the time. Um, on a, if it's a very practical thing, like on a practical level, I tell my students and my partner, I'm like, please just get off your fucking phone. Like, just get off of it. You know, like, it's not going to help you figure out um, what it is that you really want or, um, or who you might want to become. Like it's, it, it might get you part of the way, but it's, it's going to be like very limiting. And I think you see that in, um, from across the board, from all of the ways that these platforms are used for mis and, dis from in, dis mis and disinformation, but also all of the research that now is, you know, shown not just correlative, but causative uh, ties to body image, self-esteem and social media use. So, you know, I, I, try to take my students on walks without their phones. It makes them very uncomfortable. Um, to anonymous, um, that is complicated. I will say that at least in terms of my own process, um, I tend, especially with this project, uh, as I kind of indicated in the talk, it was something that kind of like I had to peck away at because it was just hard to work. Uh, you know, like many, many of you probably, it was just very hard to like do anything. Um, I became kind of, you know, paralyzed. So my process is often very intuitive, associative, um, affective. So I'm, I'm working a lot with, you know, and have worked many, many years with uh, sort of affect theory. Um, and so, you know, that is, I guess, part of it. I guess in terms of if, if you're thinking about modeling and digital doppelgangering or like digital twins, like that's something like from the engineering stuff that's very, very interesting. Um, so for example, if you're trying to create these like um, digital twin models of cities or uh, of um, environmental systems, like, and obviously these are very, very important things to develop with the climate crisis and so on. Um, but I think, uh, you know, one of the issues is that you can never really quite achieve um, like, a, like a real twin. Like that's, as, as I said, that's sort of an idealization um, because then you're, you would make something that is so much the same thing that uh, it would be identical and it, it's not. So like the digital twin stuff is, is largely aspirational because you're only modeling parts of things, not whole things. And I also think it, it raises other issues um, which speaks back to the question of the pharmacon as well, right? Which is, you know, I talked a little bit about the kinds of labor that go into producing these generative AI, but there's, there's also like this, you know, enormous uh, environmental cost, right? So um, there's a pretty well-known paper that came out, um, I think it's called On Sto Stochastic Parrots. I think Tim Nick Gebru is one of the co-authors. You know, they kind of go through, you know, some of the issues with sort of asking like, are these large uh, um, language models just too big? Um, and what are some of the consequences of, of that and of, and of using them? Um, you know, magic is sort of the stuff that I've thought in, in some ways the least, I'm not the least about, but you know, I'm a huge fan of Silvia Federici's work um, and also the way that Paul Preciado takes up her work. And, um, and, you know, over the last couple of years, I've been reading uh, back on stuff um, like related to like queer life and witchcraft. So this, this book about, um, is it called witchcraft and gay counterculture or something like that? I had to look up the reference. Um, and thinking also about the ways that queer and especially like transness have historically been connected to, um, spirituality, um, and different spiritual systems, right? Like two-spirited people and others sort of occupying these, liminal uh, spaces. But in terms of a kind of like very um, um, like I haven't developed it as like a linear kind of through line or, or thought yet. Um, 
I mean, nonlinear thought or journeys are is how we get the most interesting idea. Right. Um, there's another question about how do you think digital doppelganger is different than data body? Um, and I know I know Ireti has a question for you, so I would yeah. also invite Ireti on and uh, and ask her question. Yeah. Uh, yes, I dropped it in the chat so you can read it, but since I'm off yeah. mute, um, just how do you see this new or not even new, but alternative framing that's progressed over the last two years of you working on this as relating to your working your work on Black data, um, as discussed in Notino Shade? Yeah, so in Black data, I was really interested in things like um, what Fred Moten calls like Black ops, like these sort of counter practices to um data capture among other things it also has a very elliptical structure that piece it has is sort of in three sections um and it, like one of the like one of the artists i look at in that piece is the uh is zach glass who was very interested in um questions of opacity kind of in the in the spirit of edward glissant so you know I don't know exactly how this connects to opacity, but I know the project is still the same, somehow um, um, the same. Um, certainly a lot of the work that, and I'm curious to see this in, uh, tomorrow in some of the discussions, um, some of the work that's been done in, by Afro-Diasporic folks in the area in speculative design um starts to bring some of this together like especially with african um, um diasporic spiritual traditions right uh, uh so um so yeah so i'm very uh, kind of interested in um in that um, i think you know part of the thing in black data was also to make this argument that Black people are more than statistics, right? And, and here I think I'm trying to um, maybe do something more in the lines of, it's not quite a spec, I don't know if it's going to be a speculative project in the same way as someone like Alexis Pauline Gums, but I think there's gonna be something there that is more, um, that's more about um, teasing out this, this sense of these technologies as being like what Karen Barrett would call like interactants, right? That yeah, ChatGPT is not intelligent. None of these programs are like intelligent. They're not, they're not, right? But it doesn't mean that we can't like just like uh, that we can't understand them and their materiality as agented. And also we should take seriously the ways, like as an anthropologist, I need to take seriously the ways that people experience them as like having personalities. You know, like I, I, when I gave this talk, a version of this talk at Cornell, you know, someone was telling me this story about how she just was like randomly walking by her Alexa and her Alexa said like, that's not a very nice thing to say to me, you know? And she, and she and the woman said, well, she said this to me and I felt so like upset and I wondered what I had said to her. And I was like, she didn't, I mean, it was just random. Like it it, it was creepy. And I'm kind of interested, I think uh, tomorrow, tomorrow and maybe today too, there was stuff around like the creepiness. Like I'm interested in the creepiness, even, in, even if it isn't to say like, oh, these things are awake or like they're about to like rise up and take over. Like I'm not, I'm not really worried about the AI singularity in that way. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, we are at our closing. Uh, I feel like we could go on and on, but for the workshop participants, we'll continue the uh, conversation tomorrow. Um, please join me in uh, thanking, thanking, thanking uh, Shaka for an amazing talk and so much food for thought. Um, Shaka, it's been incredible to have you as a keynote of our workshop. And um, we will, um, yeah, have a good evening, everybody. And uh, it's been a pleasure, Shaka. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone who made this possible. And I hope to see folks tomorrow at the workshops, too.
And everyone else, thanks again. Peace.